Hello, welcome to another of our sessions of Digital Slide Review. Uh, I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from Mesa Falls, Idaho. Well, no, actually from the University of Oklahoma. And our program is part of uh, the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy uh, PATH presenter. Uh, we're talking today about a case that uh, is uh, relatively unusual, although not particularly challenging, uh, but a nice little uh, thing to be aware of. A patient uh, is a 60-year-old woman who had uh, incidentally discovered ovarian cyst, being seen for other reasons, radiographs, et cetera, et cetera, and lo and behold, uh, an abnormal finding in her uh, pelvis. So uh, it's interesting to think about what sorts of things cause uh, these less uh, symptomatic lesions, uh, incidental omas, if you will. Of course, most commonly in the ovary, you get functional cysts, uh, things that may uh, develop in the course of natural uh, hormonal cycling. Um, uh, and you may also get occasional epithelial inclusion cysts, simple paratubal cysts or uh, intraovarian uh, inclusion cysts. Uh, and then we begin to come into the more uh, uncommon lesion, the sort of mixed solid cystic tumors, most of which are benign, the teratomas and so forth. Uh, and then things like endometriomas or possibly even metastatic tumors. So it's uh, not a really complicated list to think about, uh, but certainly something to be uh, aware that the, the spectrum can include a number of uh, significant lesions. So uh, not having a histologic diagnosis, they brought the patient to surgery and submitted this tissue for frozen section, which uh, as you can see, we uh, froze uh, and included in our slide a couple of little bubbles to make the life more interesting. Uh, but actually, uh, right off the bat, we said this looks like a teratoma because uh, much of what came out uh, was uh, keratinized debris. Uh, and that uh, element is uh, seen here, a uh, little squamous uh, stratified type epithelium. Uh, sometimes you get hair, sometimes you get uh, other structures as well. Um, but of course, you always want to look around and see what you've got and sample uh, the more solid portions of the lesion. So we had a few sebaceous elements, as you can see here. Uh, and then this little nest, nested group of pink cells attracted the eye of my colleague um, uh, who looked at the case this day. And uh, as uh, she was looking at this, uh, she noted in particular that it looked like we had lots of little rosette type structures. Um, and uh, that of course, uh, in this environment, raised concern for an immature teratoma. And so that was uh, the diagnosis that was rendered uh, and it illustrates uh, one of the challenges uh, in this lesion. So uh, of course, uh, given that uh, material, uh, they did some further sampling, did uh, some peritoneal staging to make sure there was no spread. Uh, and when we saw the, the final tissue, we uh, uh, decided that uh, this was uh, still part of the teratoma. Uh, mature teratomas, of course, are a proportion of ovarian tumors, a fairly significant proportion, usually in adults, um, and have this uh, mixture of solid and cystic components, usually with all three germ layers. Uh, meaning ectoderm, endoderm, and uh, mesoderm um, that may be represented. Sometimes you may just get two and sometimes only one. Um, and of course, the, uh, the thing to be most aware of are those very elusive uh, immature components, uh, particularly if they have a neuroglial component. So very justifiably, my colleague was uh, wise in looking for uh, any evidence that there might be neuroglial components. Well, here's the uh, permanent sections, uh, as you can see. Uh, not a uh, difficulty in confirming the uh, sebaceous element here um, or the epithelial element, uh, but uh, is this uh, neuroectodermal? Well, uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that I think should uh, alert us to say probably not. First of all, these nests have very sharp borders, with the exception of this one, which has a little bit of lymphoid inflammation. Uh, these are all very sharp nests. And in addition, there is this uh, insular or uh, island uh, infiltrative pattern 
uh, to the lesion, which looks much more like the neuroendocrine tumor that in fact is what this is. So uh, recognizing this pitfall, what might have helped? Well, uh, recognizing the very sharp borders of these nests where we have this sort of rosette-like formation of these pseudoglandular forms, uh, that can help. Uh, because usually neuroglial uh, rosette forms have a, a very gradual uh, fading out of the uh, small blue cells, not this sharp insular pattern. Uh, the second feature, which I think can help to alert you to not fall into this uh, pitfall, uh, is this uh, insular pattern, which also would be extraordinarily uncommon uh, in a, uh, a neuroglial uh, lesion. Um, with this uh, fibrosis and these uh, trailing cords and nests of cells uh, in between uh, the tumor. Uh, neuroglial tumors certainly can have a fibrotic background, but it's not in quite this uh, uh, fibrous uh, pattern with the infiltrative cells in between, as we see here, with uh, quite distinct and sharp margins. So uh, with that, let's just uh, touch base a little bit about ovarian carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, these are really quite uncommon, um, and you may not encounter one in your practice. Uh, less than uh, a tenth of a percent of uh, ovarian tumors, and these are usually unilateral arising within a teratoma. Uh, traditionally, we've uh, uh, identified four different patterns <clears throat> of tumors. The stromal pattern, the trabecular pattern, <clears throat> goblet cell uh, carcinoids, and so-called insular carcinoids, which would be uh, more uh, uh, like this, although it does have a little bit of a trabecular pattern. Um, and these tend to correlate to some degree with the presence or absence of carcinoid syndrome. But uh, the, the trend in the, uh, in the, uh, um, in the, in the field, of course, is to get away from these pure histologic descriptions and speak more about uh, better predictors for behavior. Now, uh, the differential diagnosis, uh, of course, includes, as we've illustrated, immature neural elements, but metastatic disease from a gastrointestinal sort, source uh, and occasionally other uh, primary tumors of the ovary, uh, which may have a, uh, a different pattern. Usually you would not be considering these in the presence of an associated teratoma. So these would be primarily in the setting of a pure uh, carcinoid tumor without evidence of a uh, mixed uh, germ cell uh, pattern, a mixed uh, germ layer. Uh, uh, tumor. So uh, that brings us to the question of terminology. And uh, we would ask, should these just be called ovarian neuroendocrine tumors? Um, certainly there's a uh, recognition that neuroendocrine tumors, whether in the GI tract, the lung, pancreas, or other sites, um, all fall into the same general pathobiologic uh, uh, category. And the move has been towards uh, uh, applying uniform standards of morphology and grading to these tumors. Um, in ovarian carcinoid tumors, there's very limited evidence of any metastatic behavior, but it's uh, very limited. Um, and traditionally, we know that the patterns have had some predictive value, at least in terms of predicting carcinoid syndrome and so forth. So where do we go? Well, I think you can make your choice. Obviously, as I show you my sign-out diagnosis, you'll see that I'm calling this an ovarian carcinoid tumor of insular type, um, but putting in parenthesis, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor grade one, uh, just so there's no confusion. So uh, appreciate you joining us for this discussion and presentation, and we welcome your comments. Uh, if you like this, please hit the like button and uh, subscribe to the channel so you'll catch future releases uh, as we uh, try to do on a regular basis. We appreciate your uh, attention to our channel and hope that during uh, the coming days that you'll be well, uh, make good diagnosis, and hopefully also avoid those occasional pitfalls that uh, are part of our profession. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.